Welcome, everyone. This is In Time Sanctuary Present Truth Ministries. Today, we are going to do the second part series of How to Stop Sinning. It is part two of the series, and our series includes today the understanding of the nature of sin, justification, and sanctification. It is so important because many people had been confused of thinking that can we really stop sinning? In the previous episode, we discussed that we can stop sinning. Jesus empower us the Holy Spirit empower us. God the Father empower us to stop sinning. Today, we are going to discuss how to stop sinning. And so, we look at first the view of the nature of sin and its effect. Justification and sanctification. How to stop sinning? The answer of the word of God is Unequivocally true, God's acts praise of, of justification and sanctification. These two has been clearly presented in the entire scripture. However, one's understanding of the nature of sin to a large degree affect the understanding of justification and sanctification. So it is proper to start the understanding of the nature of sin. Sin is the only and ultimate problem that human has no solution. Only God has the final solution of the sin problem and its consequences. The result of sin of Adam and Eve in transgressing the simple, easy, clear command not to eat the forbidden tree provides deadly nature of sin as expressed in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Man should consider sin as an enemy with a perpetual hatred. God expressed it in the word enmity. So we should never defend sin. We should never excuse sin, nor allow to roll over us. For any sin will lead us in separation from Christ, according to Isaiah 59, verse 2. So, let's look at the anatomy of the first sin. Satan exactly knows God's explicit command in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. So he directly contradicts it. But he did not force Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. Otherwise, he would be instantly detected. Instead, entice Eve into a genius temptation by getting their attention into non-harmful but beautiful and pleasant things to the senses through deception. Genesis 3. 13, be a doubting question of God's word and authority. So mean, it means to say, Satan presents a distorted picture of God's character and the law. Thus, the anatomy of the first sin was giving a distorted mental image of God and a distorted view of violation of God's holy law and sin against its terrible result. So sin is a deliberate choice of Adam and Eve. It is breaking relationship with God, mistrust of God, refusal to follow his word, and unbelief. It is an egocentric life, selfish, rejection of God's authority, his law, his word. Which is not a mere code or of norm, but expression of his holy and loving character. 
So, sin changes perspective of reality. Sinners do not recognize and appreciate God's goodness, love, justice, order, and care. Sin under um, sin underestimates, it blurs, it blinds the real value and purpose of life and the severe consequences of sin. Sin is a wrong attitude, an enslaving power that changes human nature and leads to violence, problems, and death. Satan in deceiving Adam and Eve start intruding the person's mind, stimulate the thinking and the senses, finally controlling the mind and the behavior, then obey his suggestions and decide to violate God's law. The battle is in the mind. If Satan succeeds, he wins the war. The problem is that human has no capacity to connect with God again. So God condescends and initiates the first step, calling Adam, where are you? Genesis 3.9. When sinner responds, there is a help for helpless, his loving creator and redeemer. So, in stopping sin is that the Bible presents two kinds of power. The mystery of godliness versus the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness. Paul Rowe writes in 1 Timothy 3.16, and without great controversy, is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in flesh, justified in spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world and receive up into glory. That's what happened to Jesus. Divinity assume human flesh. Because that is our capital. Jesus is the model that human being without, the, without any attached to divinity, only obedience to God's will or the Father's will and the Holy Spirit then we have a life that is transformed into the mystery of godliness and it is comprehended only through revelation of God in Christ. The spiritual life that results in a change of heart produces through godliness. The opposite is the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness found in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. The mystery of iniquity or lawlessness is the power unseen and known except by its effect, which is ever working in the world for evil working against the law and the will of God, corrupting the minds and the heart and the soul of man. So these two mysteries is a powerful, but we are going to discuss that in one of the episodes next time. So, as we look at this mystery, we, we understand that the nature of sin is important for us to know what is sin, the description of the nature of sin. Sin seems harmless at the beginning because it is a desire, good and pleasing to the senses. But its result is horrible. But each one, according to Jim, is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. So that's the beginning of sin. It is desire and then enticed. Then when the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. James 1 verses 14 and 15. Meaning to say, we have a sinful nature, but sinful nature is a bit different because here we find in James that from a desire, entice, and then entertain, cultivate, it gives birth to sin. And then there is a full grown, then there is sin. Meaning to say, it means to say the nature of sin is not really the nature of that is, we are sinful, but rather a choice and a decision. 
The nature of sin is mystery. Insidiously and deceptive because it is inherent, unseen, connectedness, relatedness associated with the act or actual sin. So, for whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble, that is tasi in Greek, false sin or transgress. In one point, he is guilty of all. James 2.10 for example, the actual act of adultery was first on the senses of the lens of the eyes. Follow a desire in the heart, then conceive, then the actual. So the act started with covetousness of the senses, the lust of the flesh. The full-blown action committed is sin. It is not detected as a violation, transgression at the beginning. It is a feeling of pleasure and delight. This makes sins crafty. So as we look at this description of the nature of sin, we have to understand that one actual sin revolves and involves other sin. For example, David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba revolves and involves many other sins from transgression, iniquity, Sin, evil. Psalms 51, verses 124. And it includes foolishness and guile. So sin is like a wildfire that consumes the entirety of the person. For example, what sins include in iniquity? The Oxford Dictionary captured the meaning of iniquity through synonyms like wickedness, immorality, impropriety, vice, evil, sin, crime, heinousness, nefariousness, nabbery, obscenity, ungodliness. And Merriam-Webster Dictionary, iniquity includes corruption, debility, depravity, immorality, iniquitousness. Libertinism, libertinism, licentiousness, profligacy, sin, and vice. This is the mystery of iniquity. So, meaning to say, one actual sin revolves and involves many other sins, as in the case of David. If you read Psalms 38, 32, and 51, where David confesses and has the record of sin. So the words related to iniquity is also bad, evil, ill, torpitude, villainy, wickedness, wrong, atrocities, heinousness, sinfulness, unscrupulousness, viciousness, vileness, pendiness, corruptiveness, indecency, lasciviousness, perversion, wanton, and abomination. Meaning to say, we have to look at the nature of sin because at the beginning, it's not harmful. It's not dangerous. But once a person committed already, is already conceived and it's work, it is really like a cascading mountain towards destruction of people where it destroys the whole person. And so, we need to look at that, for example, murder. It starts with the feedback of the senses from the mind. Nurture negative emotion of dislike, fear, or insecurity. Then grows into aggressive behavior, conceive, hatred, and in, in a murder. Such mysterious intricacies. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you are fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 5, 21, 22. Because murder begins at the heart. This is also true to stealing. 
For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Matthew 15.9 If praises increase, do not sit your heart on them, according to Psalm 62 verse 10. Do not. Pilfering. Titus 2.10 All comes from the heart. So we have to understand the insidious nature of sin. Because unless we understand that, we cannot stop sinning. And according to Jeremiah, God said, The heart is deceitful above all things. Jeremiah 17, 9. The Ten Commandments could be transgressed, all of them, by the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet. The last commandment of the Ten Commandments, because nines are all action, but ten is an attitude where you can violate all those actions by entertaining in your mind and your attitude. This commandment appears harmless, but covetousness is deadly. Only by guessing innocently, later develop into a crime. You find it in Joshua 7.21. Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Luke 12.15 Evil is in the hearts. Psalms 28.3 With perversity in his heart continually devises evil who spreads strife. Proverbs 6.4 The evil is in the heart. Psalm 28.3 With perversity in the heart Continually devises evil who spreads stripes. Proverbs 6.14 So we plead with God, Incline my heart to your testimony and not to covetousness. Psalm 119.36 So, the result of sin. Yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing. But your covetousness for shedding innocent blood practicing oppression and violence. It started with the eyes and the heart, covetousness, and then shedding of blood, practicing oppression and violence. And sin is abhorrence to God because any created being who sin against God will be separated from him. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot be saved, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. So that is the nature of sin. Once you have done it, you are separated from God, and we are. His face is hidden from us. He will not hear us. So look at how Really deadly is sin. But since we love sin, that's what's the problem. So the nature of sin will throw us out of God's sight. But the enemy of God, blinded Christian, that sin is not too serious and it is okay to continue sinning, is the best species of self-deception that many Christians are not aware of. Everyone who incurs sin comes short of God's glory, and its consequences is death. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Romans 3.23 For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 We need to understand also that God hates all sin, whether it is small, whether it is acted or it is still in the mind. Sin is harmful to us and those around us. We enjoy sin too much for it gratifies and satisfies the lust of the flesh. But God loves righteousness and hated lawlessness. Hebrews 1.9 And whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. 1 John 3.4 You hate all workers of iniquity. Psalms 5, verse 5. Let none of you think evil in your hearts, Jesus says, against your neighbor. Do not love false oath. 
For these all things I hate, says the Lord. Zechariah 8, 17. Job says, if I sin, then you mark me and will not acquit me of my iniquity. Job 10, 14. Sin is so destructive in almost everything it touches and it connects. The Lord hates all sin and all sin is worth condemnation. Its destructiveness brings separation from God and withdrawals of his protecting care. Sinners are following another master, the enemy of righteousness. The problem really is us. Why we cannot stop sinning? The scripture has many references how to stop sinning, but many people did not see it because the devil blinded our eyes our brain to see so that he continue to deceive us and finally it's beyond repair beyond reach of God's mercy the problem is that when we face our enemy temptation and desire we found out that it is in us it is me is the number one enemy Reason, because ourselves is the best enemy because we give attention and entertain them with our senses. Besides, temptation, the lure, the enticement, the enemy will hypnotize us, anesthetize us in his deception. He makes them so attractive and appealing and irresistible. As a result, we found ourselves in the forbidden ground, the territory of God's enemy. Sin is a tyrant enemy. We must take all precaution what the scripture says in stopping sin. When we are aware and conscious and determined, as James says, therefore submit to God first, resist the devil and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. Then victory is assured. Because sin, when we commit sin, that becomes our master. Jesus says, we cannot serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24. Many other things of it only as money. Wrong. It applies to many things. But the principle goes beyond riches and wealth. But as Jesus answered, and most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. John 8, 34. Meaning to say, sin has the power and influence to make you slave. You are a servant to whom you obey. This is what Jesus says. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Don't realize that you become slave whatever you choose to obey. You can be a slave to sin that leads to death. Or you can choose to obey which leads to righteous living. Romans 6.16 When we choose to sin, that is our master. If we choose to obey God's commandment, our master is the God of righteousness and holiness. Once we live a life of unrighteousness, we are cutting our relationship to God because holiness cannot exist with sin. We must choose who really is our master. We cannot have both. How to stop sinning? Just follow instruction. Paul warns, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 34 So the best thing to do is decisively separate from corrupt companions. It is logical, practical, not to entangle with deception from corruption of evil. Do not be deceived. Apostle asserts also, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning, we have to wear the power of God's grace, the power of Jesus 
in all our being. This is means putting on the Lord Jesus. Make no provision of the flesh to fulfill his lust. Romans 13, 14. Meaning to say, we should not have any reservation when the flesh desire us to commit sin. He admonishes it for he knows that believers can do it in the power of Jesus Christ. Many times, we drop our guard and we become complacent. So the enemy has an entry point so we need to put on the Lord always. Sin is a personal choice. Jesus says, enter the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go into in by it because narrow is the gate, difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Matthew 7, 14 and 13. The natural heart loving the wide road is a good choice rather than the challenging narrow road. Deny your choice and follow God's ways. King Solomon wisely advises us, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it the spring springs the issue of life. Put away from your deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. And let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the left nor to the right. Remove your foot from evil. Proverbs 4, 23 to 27. It is not a difficult instruction. But when we entertain and we do our choice, that's the end. Meaning, we have to control. Because once we believe in Jesus, there is an inherent power. To become a children of God. John 1.12. So Jesus says in a radical instruction to those who have many reasons and arguments that they cannot stop sinning. But I say to you, whoever looks to a woman to last here has already committed adultery. With her in her heart. If your eye, right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is more profitable for you, one of your members perish, than your whole body cast into the head. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to cast into the hell. Matthew 7, 28 and 30. It means to say, meaning we need to control our senses and body parts that causes us to sin. Jesus says we are evil. If not, when we allow our body members run its lustful and sinful desire, the end is cast in the hell of fire. So it is a matter of choice and personal deception. Decision. So we can stop sinning according to Paul by fleeing. He said the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, and contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresy, envy, murders, drunkenness. I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such thing will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Did you understand this? We need to look at anyone who practiced that will never inherit the kingdom. So this should be countered by the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 23. No other choice if you want to stop sinning. Paul says, flee also youthful lust. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2.22 Fleeing away is the best decision rather than coming near. But sinful things, lustful desire are sweet and had magnetic power to pull near. Pull us near but it ends in bitterness and misery. 
So God has always a way of escape. Let us remember that. No temptation has overtaken you except such common to a man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond you are able. But with temptation, he also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Many times we follow our own way rather than the ways of escape that God has for us. Paul says, I urge you, brethren, not those who cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrines which you learn. Avoid them. So avoiding them, Romans 16, 17, we can avoid sinning by freeing, playing away, flee from youthful lust, flee from sexual immorality, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee from idolatry, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, put to death. Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry, Colossians 3, 5. Blessed are those who do his commandments. They may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the holy city. Revelation 22 verse 14. So in fact we are. Even abstain from every form of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Should be followed as a deterrent of sin. Paul says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnare, deceive us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for joy was set before, endured to the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. So there is a power. We can stop. Because he said play, avoid, run away, kill all those. But let's look at the power of the gift of justification by faith. Many Christians have understood the theory of justification. But do not know what justification really is all about. There are inherent questions associated with justification. What is the source of justification? What are the requirements to be justified? What is the ground of justification? What is the means and methods of justification? When does justification take place and complete it? Can we lose justification and in what ways? This question must be answered for justification is the beginning source of power of stopping sin together with sanctification. Justification is a gift from God. Being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in Jesus. Romans 3.24 The gift of grace resulted in justification that having been justified by grace we should become ears according to the hope of eternal life. Titus 3.7 Thus the source of justification is God's free grace. The requirements of justification are plainly stated in the word of God. First is a call. Then believe what God says. Abraham believed the Lord and he was accounted to it to him as righteousness. Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3, and 15, 6. But to him who does not work but believe on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 4, 5. Thus Jesus says, I have not come to call righteous but sinners to repentance. Repentance means change of mind. Turn to God. Acts 3.19 It requires through brokenness of spirit and its regretful acknowledgement of sin with commitment to change life. It involves godly sorrow bring repentance that leads to salvation. 2 Corinthians 17 It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And the forgiveness of sin. So these are the, the means. And now let's go to the ground of justification. The ground of justification is the death and resurrection of the Lord. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and raised because of our justifications. Romans 4 24-25 
the means of justification is through the blood of Christ. Much more than having justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of him. So, the method of justification is by faith. Even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and all who believe, might be just and justified one who has faith in Jesus. Therefore, having been justified by faith, so everything comes from the Lord. So justification is complete. Justification begins by a time a sinner believes and comes to Christ and accepts him as a God and the Lord of his life and personal Savior. Confess and repent his sin. Trusted Christ as the only hope and receive pardon of his sin. The repentant sinner is cleansed. Now he is declared righteous and right with God. He is in the right relationship with God. He creates a new heart through the Holy Spirit, experiences a new birth, sanctified, and walk in the newness of life. Now justification is complete. Because once you are justified, you don't want to commit sin because you lose your justification. Justification is not only change of status, but also transformation of character. Sin is no longer the master of a righteous person that made him before a slave to sin. He is freed from sin. He died to sin and lives for God. Romans 6, 7, 8 and verse 11. So the Lord is the new master of the righteous. Renders obedience righteousness. Having been set free from sin, you become slave of righteousness. Now slave to righteousness, no longer slave to sin. Romans 6, Verse 16 and 18. The righteousness of God empowers him from committing any sin through the Holy Spirit. So, the status is changed from sinner to righteous. To justify is to declare righteous to make one right with God. Justification is God declaring that those who receive Christ to be righteous based on Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 In justification, God does not make sinner righteous. He declares that person is righteous. Justification takes place outside the sinners and changes their standing before God. Romans 5.2 So justification is right relationship with God. This justification is not licensed to violate God's law. So it's a determined how to stop sinning. Having declared righteous, Christians now can, are empowered to control or stop sinning. They are required living a righteous life before God. By continually sinning, meaning violation of God's law, justification or righteousness is lost. Justification and sanctification cannot be separate from each other. Justification imputes Christ's righteousness to the sinner. And sanctification imparts righteousness to the sinner personally and practically. Thus, sanctification is internal and changes the believer's state. Justification is an event. Sanctification is a process. So we started now in the upward light from repentance to sanctification. Let's look at the experience of David. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, my sin always before me against you. You only I have sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin of my mother conceived me. Here we found it. Not only cleans, blood, transgression, was the iniquity, cleans from sin. This is the experience of David when he committed sin against Bathsheba. And so he said, purge me. With the high soap and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Because it will separate us. He said, make me hear the joy, the gladness, the bones that you have broken. May rejoice. 
Hide your face from my sin. This is in Isaiah 59. One, blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew your steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. Uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressor your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Did you understand? When we commit sin, our heart is not clean. The Holy Spirit is removed. That's why He is pleading, do not take away your spirit, your generous spirit. We must be born again when we have this. And the experience of David should be the experience of everybody. So, the promise is, I will give you a new heart. Putting a new spirit within you, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of the flesh. I will put my spirit within you and push you to walk my statue and you will keep my judgment and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I give your father and you shall be my people and I will be your God. It is God who give us a new heart because our heart is hard as stones. He will put us the spirit so that we can keep his judgment is law, and we can do them. This is the covenant. If you found it in Hebrews 8, verse 10 to 11, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And their sin and their lawlessness, I will remember no more. So we need to understand. So meaning to say, we can stop sinning by keeping God's word in our own heart. How to stop sinning? Is to store the head in the head God's word and his law. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things of your law. And so, how is sin shall to put or deposit God's word in our mind? In a memory bank. And commit to memory. And we see things never seen before. Not only by the verses and chapters. This is how the word of God is hidden or keep in the mind. The natural mind will not endure God's word. But when the Holy Spirit transforms the mind, God's word and his law becomes our delights due to a clean and a new heart. He delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law, he meditates his day and night. He shall lay like be a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruits in its season, who sleep also will not wither. Whatever he does, he prosper. That's a person who has a clean heart. He loves commandments. I lie, delight myself your commandments, which I love. My hands also will lift my your commandments, which I love. I will meditate your statutes. Psalm 119, 47, 48. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day. Through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. They are even with me. I have more understanding of all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more of the ancient because I keep your precept. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgment. For you for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my test, sweet than honey to my mouth. Through your precept, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Here is now a man who is sanctified. He rejoices the law. The law is his meditation day and night. So he cannot do sinning. If he sin, he can, he. He asks forgiveness, but he does not continually do it because it separates him from God. So once you are justified, you are reconciled. We are justified by his blood, we shall be saved from his wrath. For if we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So, after justification, reconciliation by Jesus Christ. So, the ultimate 
gift of God is the power of the gift of sanctification. When we receive the gift of justification by faith, being reconciled, we're right with God, just before Him, having a right relationship, just made perfect. Hebrews 12, 23. The right relationship must flourish or continue growing. The process of growing in that relationship is the gift of sanctification we call into a life of holiness. Justification and sanctification cannot be separated as a mighty power of God's grace overcoming sin. Justification is right standing with God and sanctification is, is staying with right relationship with God continually. Staying with God means stopping with sin because you cannot stay with God and still doing sin. There are differences of expression means the same thing, sanctification. Abiding Christ, John 14, 15, that is sanctification. That's a life of holiness. Walk in the Spirit in Galatians 5, 16, 25. Led by the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5, 18. Christ lives in me, Galatians 2, 20. Christ in you, that Christ may dwell in your heart. All of these are really the life of sanctification. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.23 If we do not live a life of holiness or sanctification, we reject God's will. Holiness is the quality of life in heaven. Anything short of it, no entrance in heaven. Holiness of God is a debt to sinners. How important then is to stay with sanctification? We are called to a life of holiness that is an imperative. Having been justified, the believers will pursue peace with all people. Holiness without which no one will see the law. Did you see that? Without sanctification, without holiness, we simply not to exist because of the impeccable holiness of God. And sanctification is staying right with God. For this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, living an example that you should follow his step, who committed no sin. There was no deceit found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22. For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but holiness. Therefore, he, reject the, he who rejects this call does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his spirit. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. Who has saved us and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the time began. 119. Walking in holiness is walking in God's commandment. This is love, that we walk according to his commandment. And this commandment that you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Second John verse 6. That is now the life of sanctification. That is a life of holiness. Since you purified your soul in obeying the truth through the Spirit, sincere love, brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. How are we purified, sanctified? Walking besides that. Obeying the truth. Obedience to God's command. That's why we find this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep God's commandment and the faith of Jesus. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Luke eleven twenty eight. So holiness is a separation from wickedness. Holiness should lead a separation from wickedness of sin. He spoke to the congregation saying, depart from the tents of these wicked men. Touching nothings of theirs, lest you will be consumed all their sins. Therefore, come out from among them. Separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be your father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Holiness is possessed characteristics of the saints. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We are called to a life of holiness. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of heavenly calling, consider apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 3.1. 
how to solve sin, watch out all deception. Humanity fall into sin by Satan deception. Me, Genesis 3, 13, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Adam and Eve were deceived, fell into transgression. There is no single on planet earth that he has not prepared his innumerable deception. Then Satan deceives the whole world, Revelation 12, 9. Deceived those who dwell on earth, Revelation 13, 14. All nations were deceived, Revelation 18, 23. He has a global partners of deception. Religious, politics, and all business besides all fallen angels, according to Revelation 19, 20, and 20 verses 3, 8, and 10. This is the weakest of all area of many Christians have overlooked. The only thing of temptation, the visible harsh work of the devil, like opposing the truth, persecution, hatred, war, and the like. Deception are the deadliest of all avenues of sinning against God. Both visible and invisible, he works underground. It is invisible, are difficult to discern because... They, uh, they did not study the word of God. They take for granted, ignore the wiles of the devils, the methods of the devil, the scheme, the skill, the tactics that he employed. By deception, he blinded people to see real things and its consequences. Second Corinthians 4. Please read, my brothers and sisters. He study. The innumerable deception of Satan. You will find them in the great controversy, snare of Satan, 518 to 530. Okay? So Jesus said, the biblical writers, we need to warn Jesus repeatedly. Warn multitudes of avenues of visible deception. Biblical writers warn all kinds of deception, including personal deception, due to sinfulness of the heart and mind. But this is difficult to discern because we rationalize it and we defend it. The heart is deceitful above all things. Do not be deceived. This is what Paul, but evil men and impostor will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. For sin has taken occasionally by the commandment, deceive me. Ellen White, I hope you study the, the writings of Ellen White. All of us, from innocent to the most genius, he has a numerable deception that sought to our test and our status in life. So I want you to read Pachak and Prophets, pages 33 to 43. Why sin permitted? And temptations and the fall. Testimonies to minister. Be careful minister. The snare of Satan. Because how can we skip deception when we are not studying? Jesus repeatedly warned multitudes of avenues. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and deceit. Empty deceit, according to tradition of men, not according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. We have. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Let no one deceive you by any means. There's a lot, a lot. If you look at only the vocabulary of deception, much more in the writings of Ellen White, this is where the devil has gain foothold in the garden of Eden. So the same is using. We are the same. Warning of deception is common. Let no one deceive you. First John 3, 7 and 8. Right? Because there are tricky men, cunning, crafty, the selfish plotting. Do not desire delicacies. They are deceptive food. Even food, there are deceptive in it. Elements. Food has its own inherent deceptiveness. Do not be deceived. Deception is so terrible, but we have not studied so much. He is able to do everything. The helpless sinner must cling to Christ as his only hope. If he lets his hold for a moment, he imperils his souls and others. 
only the exercise of living faith were sin. But the commission of any known sin, neglect of known duties, home or abroad, we destroy faith and disconnect soul from God. Faith I leave by page 138. That he should grant to you, according to the riches of his glory, is strengthened with the might through his spirit, the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend all the things, which is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. He gives us everything through faith. We just believe and live and follow his work. Through faith, every deficiency of character may be supplied. Every department cleans, every fault corrected, every excellent developed. Education 257. Amazing grace. In order to benefit God's grace, we must have our part. Faith and works, page 47. Human efforts avails nothing without divine power. Without human endeavor, divine effort is with many of no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must hack our part. His grace is given to work in us to will and to do, but never a substitute of our effort. Patrick and Prophets 487. Must, man must do his part. He must be a victor of his own account through the strength and grace of Christ that gives him. Must, man must be co-worker with Christ in labor in overcoming everything. The Stimulus Volume 4, pages 32-33. We must remember that our hearts naturally depraved and are evil. Ourself to pursue right course. It is only by grace of God, combined with the most earnest effort on our part, then we can gain victory. Amazing Grace 258. So, meaning to say, overcoming sin is a synergistic work. Let's do our part and God will do his part. We need to consent that the power of God is in us. Divine grace is a great element of saving power. Without it, all human effort is an ability. There is only one power that can either make us steadfast or keep us so, the grace of God in truth. He who is trying to become holy in his heart, keeping the law is a thing thing and impossibility. All that man can do without Christ is a polluted with selfishness and sin. It is grace alone through faith that can make us holy. This is a requirement. Living by grace to illuminate means fulfilling God's requirement under grace is the same made in Eden perfect obedience to the law. Grace is an attribute of God exercised toward and deserving human being. We did not seek it, but it was sent to search us. God rejoices to bestow his grace, not because we are worthy, but because we are utterly unworthy. Divine grace is a great element of saving power. It is the power of grace that draws men to obedience to the truth. Divine grace is the great element of saving power. It is the power of his grace that draws men together in obedience to the truth. Grace is power. Ellen White repeatedly all everything is by grace because the gospel is the gospel of grace. In fact, he's, he explains a lot. It is grace that is our reservoir. Synergistic. Let's do our part. And God will do his part. God says, stop sinning. I'll give you power. Unless we consent, we are helpless. Second to the third, last slide. If only we pay attention, listen, and obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit, for he gives power to overcome sin. This is repeated eight times in Revelation. He who was here, let him hear what the Spirit says. They will be overcomers. Remember that the seven churches, from the time of Jesus to the end of time, he empower us. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. To him who overcomes, I will grant him 
to sit with me on my throne as I have overcame. Revelation 21. It is the absence of the Holy Spirit that makes the gospel ministry powerless even in stopping sin. My brothers and sisters, this is a solemn message. We discuss, yes, the Bible gives us a lot of references. We can stop sinning. Yes, we can stop. Now, we discuss how to stop sinning. It is in your hand. Because when we stop sinning, God's work in the entire world will be finished. Because when we stop sinning, that is the character of God manifested that we can overcome sin by His grace. And then God's work will be finished because sin is powerless when we accept the power of God's grace to stop sinning. I hope that this second part will help us open our mind to understand. In the third part, which is sick, next time, we're going to discuss how to stop sinning because I have discussed only through the scripture sinning that is sin of commission. We will look at how to stop sin of omission because this has been taken for granted by many, many Christian, which is serious in Jesus' last day events, particularly in Matthew 25. So, sin of commission, we can stop. But sin of omission, we can stop also, as we are going to discuss that thoroughly, biblically, the next time episode. God bless us. Let us pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. That God will empower us to stop sinning. This is my prayer.